This video is the first video in a series on implicit bias. You'll learn some basics on bias, including how bias functions, why it's important, and how it's harmful. I'll provide links to resources after the video. Once you've completed this video, please view our other content on implicit bias where we look deeper into specific biases like race, gender, aging, and poverty, among others. My name is Kristen Sewell. I'm the Director of Content Production for Michigan Health Council. I have degrees in sociology and anthropology and was a doctoral candidate at Michigan State University before joining Michigan Health Council in 2017. I taught courses in biological and cultural evolution, gender, race, identity, colonialism, and archaeology at Michigan State. I'm published on those topics as well. Let's begin by talking about categories. Categorizing is how humans organize information in our minds to help us access it quickly and easily. It's a really fast way of processing available data. Do you remember the song from Sesame Street, One of These Things is Not Like the Others? You probably learned it as a three or four year old. Sesame Street showed us as children the importance of making categories. We categorize objects, people, places, abstract ideas, everything. Making categories is a normal part of cognitive development. When we're given information, we assess it for what's new, different, or changed. Then we match it to other things we already know. We use each new piece of information to navigate the real world. As a child, we might imagine a bug to look like this. Then we get more information. Some bugs are called insects and are harmless. Then we have our first experience with the business end of a bumblebee. Okay, not always harmless. Then we're told there are some bugs that are not insects at all. Spiders are arachnids. And there are some spiders that are dangerous. The category bug is filling up with types of insects and spiders. Creating categories helps humans evaluate and organize the world around us. It helps us simplify information and create rules. Those rules take the shape of algorithms and tell us how we should respond to simple, low-stakes situations. If this, then that, so we can anticipate outcomes. I've done this before, so I can easily predict how this will end. It helps us decide how to allocate our time or money. This is necessary. That is not. This is important. That, not so much. We make snap decisions based on quickly determining the most important variables of a given situation. Instead of sitting down and tediously analyzing all the different variables of a problem, regardless of the relevance or weighted importance of each element. If you're deciding what to have for lunch, you don't need to read the whole menu from cover to cover usually. You already know you want a cold sandwich, so you hop right to the section with cold sandwiches. You might enjoy trying something else, but you've only got a half an hour and you just don't want to think about it. It's a harmless decision and it's safe. There's no risk involved. You pick the sandwich you had the last time you ate at this deli. This bias is called the familiarity principle. It's a bias based on exposure. You selected the deli because it's familiar, and you selected a sandwich you've had before because you already know it's tasty. So bias is normal and has a kind of utility. Where do the wheels come off the wagon? Well, biases are a problem when mindfulness, self-reflection, and critical thinking are required, but those bias muscles respond instead. It's easy to see how being familiar with a group, recognizing people with similar worldviews, and identifying people like you can lead to bias in favor of those things. It can also lead to being unfair or even cruel to people who are different, think differently, and are unlike you in a multitude of ways. So let's talk about some of the explicit ways people demonstrate harmful bias. We won't dwell on explicit bias except to illustrate that it's, well, explicit and easy to identify. Fat shaming. This ad is for people for the ethical treatment of animals, non-human animals. Sexism. Okay, this one's pretty old. How about this one? This looks like a crime in progress. Protesting civil rights for the LGBTQ community. Writing your bias on a sign. Bias justified by religious beliefs gives your bias power. Anti-aging. This is an ad for wrinkle cream. It might as well be an ad for time machines. Deliberately making life harder for people with disabilities. Parking like this isn't an accident. This is a statement. Neo-Nazis, Nuff said. Regardless of how you feel about a nuanced political debate on immigration reform, this is not that. Most of the signs about the importance of English are misspelled. This is about foreigners. Explicit bias is fairly easy to identify and avoid. 
Most harm comes from implicit biases. We run into implicit bias all day long. Let's get some definitions out of the way. Implicit bias is based on those quick and easy data processing mechanisms in our brain. It's largely unconscious. It's the process of associating stereotypes with categories of people without conscious awareness. Implicit bias is efficient, but rarely accurate and often harmful. And the paradox is that you can explicitly believe in fairness, equity, and justice and still act on implicit biases. Icebergs are a cliche, I know, but an effective cliche. Implicit bias lives below the water. Your conscious views are above the water. Your unconscious mind absorbs millions of pieces of information, but your conscious mind only processes a small fraction of it. How many times have you driven all the way to work without actually being aware of it? Remember learning to drive and how it seemed impossible to check the mirrors and scan all the sides of your vehicle for approaching objects while also maintaining the appropriate speed and distance from other cars? Now you do it effortlessly, using your eyes, ears, hands, and feet, all at the same time while listening to music or talking to a passenger. And sometimes you even do it while daydreaming. That's how implicit bias works. You have explicit conscious understanding and implicit unconscious reactions. Implicit biases can have harmful consequences. Accidents can happen. Implicit bias operates in three parts. Priming, associations, and assumptions. Priming is a setup. It's the establishment of an emotional response in association with a word, image, or sound. We also refer to this process as conditioning. Advertisers are really good at it, as we saw. We've probably all seen these kinds of images on social media, right? They're supposed to trigger an emotion. Frustration, discomfort, in the extreme, maybe even helplessness. Each person might react differently. Some may not react at all. I'm not one of those people. These pictures make me want to fix the objects to create some sense of order. But since I can't transport myself into the photo, I'm left feeling frustrated. If I was an advertiser and was selling a solution for that feeling, I could use these images to make my audience feel frustration and then offer them some relief. After looking at disorder, this symmetrical design is very satisfying. With enough exposure or priming, our brains make shortcuts so we get the message instantaneously. Associations are the result of priming. As an advertiser, I want you to associate my hypothetical product with that feeling of relief. But advertising is just a small piece of the puzzle. We've learned through a lifetime of priming or conditioning to make associations for groups of people too. We learn how to think about each other through popular media, song lyrics, movies, gaming, textbooks, the stories we tell each other in jokes, and by living in relatively segregated communities where that familiarity principle is reinforced. When I say the words kindergarten teacher, who do you envision? And if I say the words shop teacher, who do you picture? And if I say the words history professor, who comes to mind now? If I say the word gangster, who do you think of? What about the words gang member? Who are you picturing now? And that's the final part of the process, the assumption. We even make assumptions about the term implicit bias, that it's a euphemism for racism. There are implicit biases on gender, sexuality, wealth status, weight or body size, ability, and so many other categories. The problem with assumptions is that they have a cumulative effect that can cause harm. They're death by a thousand cuts. They support institutions and systems that limit opportunity and success. Not recognizing bias functions to maintain inequities. Let's consider body weight. We often use weight as a proxy for health, and it tends to be the focus of medical exams, at least where overweight people are concerned. But we also seem to be inundated with things that make us unhealthy, like lattes, pizza, fast food, and soft drinks. It's some serious mixed messaging, isn't it? Being overweight is more than a health issue for the individual. There's social stigma to excessive weight, too. How does our culture signal to us that being overweight is a social problem? Look at all the headless people shown here. This is how obesity is depicted in the news. Media protects our identity because of how shameful and stigmatizing being overweight is. Not only do these messages tell you how to think about other people, they also tell you how to think about yourself. These images teach you to be ashamed. Why is junk food so readily available, but there's an absence of size-inclusive stores? 
Even bras have an upper limit. Not in cup size, of course. Large breasts are always welcome in our culture, but band size, the part that goes around your ribs, that definitely has an upper limit. Why can I get a latte on almost any corner, but fat people are not represented in advertising or fashion magazines? Even plus size models are relatively small. They usually don't actually wear plus size clothing. They're just bigger than most standard size models. There's a constant onslaught of diet products, diet programs, diet books, workout clothes, and shapewear. There's no scarcity of people talking about how they are desperately trying to avoid becoming a fat person. Other people, non doctors, Feel that talking to you about your body is fair game. Can you think of another situation where scrutinizing a person's body wouldn't be considered offensive or at the very least creepy? The assumption is that extra body fat is equivalent to poor health, poor hygiene, ignorance, laziness, lack of willpower, or self-indulgence and gluttony. And just plain unsightly, right? At least that's how Lindy West framed it in her viral article where she came out as overweight entitled, Hello, I am fat. She called it the ick factor. You might touch me on an airplane, ew. With your fat, ew. The ick factor has been a part of discrimination for a long, long time. The unvarnished horror on people's faces when confronted with gay couples and public displays of affection. The fear that mentally ill people might be contagious. Black people drinking from white-only fountains and swimming in public pools. Women being quarantined during their periods and feminine hygiene products being embarrassing to purchase. People living in poverty being called trash. All these things imply dirty, nasty, and gross. These are biases, and that unvarnished horror impacts systems. How do our individual biases shape and uphold systems? Let's stick with body size for a minute. What kinds of associations do you have with a person who's overweight? Consider those associations for a moment. Think of the words. How many of the words are hurtful? Do you make any assumptions about the overweight person's capability? How they live? Their intelligence? As an employer, what role do your assumptions have on your decisions regarding employment, salary, leadership expectations? How do the decisions you make impact the overweight person's life? Will it affect their ability to be employed by you? How will you value them? Will that value translate to their income level, their earning potential? Those lost opportunities have a ripple effect. Will your view of them impact their ability to buy a home, their ability to send their kids to college, their ability to retire? Employment, education, retirement, home ownership are all part of our economic system. Your bias shapes and upholds that system and determines who's allowed in and who must be kept out. And likewise, their participation in or absence from the system reinforces your biases. In America, people who live in poverty have a higher rate of obesity than those who do not. This is largely attributed to access to fresh food or food deserts, food insecurity, hunger related to poverty, and the use of food stamps or SNAP, which incentivizes shelf stable foods rather than produce or other perishable foods simply because shelf-stable foods stretch further and provide more calories or energy than more nutritious perishable foods. Basically, on food stamps, you get more caloric bang for your buck from a Snickers bar than from cabbage. Once you're sick from obesity with joint pain, fatigue, cardiovascular disease, or diabetes, it becomes even more difficult to lose weight. By now, you may have developed the thought, well, they have a choice. Well, the truth is, abuse and shame don't cause people to change their behavior. It just causes emotional pain. We're going to talk a lot more about bias around body weight in another video, so we'll stop here for now. Implicit bias in healthcare, specifically between patients and clinicians, can be devastating. 
It has real effects on clinical experiences and outcomes. It isn't just that providers have bias and treat their patients differently based on those biases, or that patients prefer clinicians who are like themselves, concordance. Women prefer female. Older people prefer older. Black people prefer black clinicians, and so on. Patients from marginalized groups easily perceive bias from their health care providers. They know they're being treated differently. Not only does this erode trust, but patients are shown to have less ability to remember instructions given by providers who they don't connect with and are less likely to ask questions when they don't understand the instructions. So you know you've got biases. You've experienced a lifetime of encountering people in different contexts. If you're like me, You may have lived in a mostly white middle-class neighborhood and attended schools that are also mostly white and middle-class. Our system was designed that way, wasn't it? Those people are familiar, understood for the most part, and predictable. Kind of like the sandwich we chose at the deli earlier. They're easy for me. But then as I got older, I started adding new people to what I already knew. I didn't know much about them, but college, travel, movies, TV, books advertising, friends, family, politics, stories my relatives told me, the jokes I heard on late night TV, those things filled in the blanks. I started to learn what to think about people who looked or acted different from those I understood really well. And just like I had done with bugs when I was little, I realized I'd been putting people in categories. And I was wrong, because people are not bugs. People are complex and have stories, lifetimes of experiences that are different from mine, that shaped them just as I am shaped by my own lived experiences. But everyone has biases. It's normal. The key is to become aware at the moment it's happening, to recognize your biases for what they are, to develop self-awareness. The triangle of awareness includes three elements of the inner experience, thoughts, emotions, body sensations. The goal of mindfulness is to pay attention to the state of these passing elements. You can practice through this exercise. Sit in a quiet space and notice your heartbeat. Notice your foot is falling asleep. Notice your breathing. Notice the thoughts that pop into and out of your mind. Acknowledge those things and let them go. Do this daily until it becomes natural to you. Intentionally notice your emotions, thoughts, and sensations as they respond to triggers. Once you've developed the skill, the ability to notice, apply that skill to how your mind responds to people. Recognize othering. Recognize discomfort, fear, disgust. Any automatic judgment you make when encountering other people. Once you've noticed your biases, the next step is to examine, dissect, and unpack those biases. When you begin to notice your biases, you might also begin to notice your privileges. Are you white? Did you grow up with both parents? Did your parents own your house or did they rent? Did you get to play sports or join clubs in school? Have you ever known anyone who went to prison? Can you travel without having to explain yourself? Do you own a bathing suit? Do you want privacy to practice your religion? Do you ever get selected for random screening at the airport? Does eating in public cause you low-level anxiety? Can you take a walk after dark? Have you ever had to decide whether it's safe to introduce your partner to your coworkers? Do you assume the salesperson following you around the store is just being helpful? When you walk into a room, do you scan the room looking for someone like you? Do you easily find someone? Is it easy to find movies and television shows with people like you featured? Have you ever had to look up a building online to make sure it doesn't have stairs or other features that make it impossible to access? If an employer states they require a criminal background or credit check, do you reconsider applying for the job? When you unpack your invisible knapsack, what do you find? Examine how your lived experiences have shaped your beliefs, attitudes, and understanding of the world. Not doing this work, leaving it to other people with more power and authority, is how inequities are kept safe. Begin looking into your biases and your privilege. You can begin to dismantle the policies and structures that hold inequity in place. No problem, right? Change begins with you. It will take work, constant maintenance, and upkeep. And it might be uncomfortable at times, but it's important work. The work begins on the inside. Inside ourselves, inside our teams, inside our organizations, inside our communities inside the systems we live in. Now that you understand what implicit bias is, 
We hope that you will seek out our other videos on race, body size, aging, gender, sexuality, and ability. Thank you.